Hi, everyone. So my name's Margaret. Like Lucy said, I graduated in 2013 from the law school. And I thought I was going to go into government service. I was expecting to work at the State Department, maybe on tech and digital diplomacy. But while I was here at the law school, when I started in 2010, they had just opened up this building. And I kind of meandered over here, probably autumn quarter, around this time in 2010. And I was really excited about the methodology and the ways of solving problems that have been developed in this building with kind of a cross linking of faculties um, and disciplines. So I will use today to hopefully talk a little bit upfront for maybe 25 minutes maximum about how we work using design methods crossed over into design and the legal system show you some examples, show you lots of photos, tell you some stories. But the balance of the time we'll spend together is actually trying it out yourselves in small teams that I'll guide and facilitate you through. Um, so yes, so I'll talk a little bit about how design and policy are coming together. And if you're at all interested about a career in this space where some opportunities are, make sure that you know what the heck I'm talking about when I talk about design and how lawyers and policymakers can benefit from it. The main part will be actually practicing it. So it should be fun, it should be active, not too much of me talking at you. If you have questions, please interrupt me. I prefer dialogues rather than monologues. Uh, and if anything I say is confusing, uh, bathrooms are down that corridor. Feel free to use the space, we'll use it a lot later. Okay, anything before we start? Great. So uh, yes, I think there's a big community here at Stanford and the Bay Area mm -hmm. that are linking together design methods and a design way of doing innovation work with policy and social justice um, improvements, specifically in the legal system. Um, so that's what my lab is focused at. I run a lab, it's almost six years old, um, where we are working using design methods and emerging technologies to ask how we can provide better legal services, different kinds of legal systems to people, um, especially in the civil justice system. And this focus on design and policy, we look at the legal system through it, but there's a much larger trend in policy making world, like if you go to World Economic Forum or city governments or other kinds of networks of policy makers, there's a lot of talk right now about these words like agile governance, public interest technology, prototyping of policy, all at this kind of intersection of methods from tech, engineering, and design brought over into the world of policy and law. There's been a lot of policy labs that have opened up within governments, both at, both at municipal and federal and intergovernmental agency level, where there's the idea of um, maybe our public institutions do not have the best relationships with citizens. How do we set up some kind of skunk works or some kind of lab where we can get more citizens involved, more people who come from non-traditional backgrounds, including engineers and techies, to figure out how we can build a new type of policy making practice inside of our government agencies. So even around here in the Bay Area, we see lots of policy labs or innovation labs, whether it's in the city of Oakland, whether it's local foundations like the Tipping Point, whether it's the federal government with 18F, whether it's the city of San Jose, or even here on campus, the Stanford Computational Policy Lab over in MSNE. All of these are kind of with a central core hypothesis that we can do innovation work inside of policy channels if we have different types of professionals working on policy problems with a different kind of methodology. And the goal is to set up these labs that can do government and law work, but in spaces that are more neutral, have a laboratory-like feel, that are user-centered, that's focused on social outcomes, and it's focused on digital services. It all sounds kind of jargony. But the real goal here is to how do we get more creativity in how we set and form and implement policy? How do we experiment and get more empirical data about what works or doesn't? And how do we make it more participatory that people who aren't usually part of policy making circles are involved? So when I go to all these meetings, like I travel a lot to a lot of places where they're talking about new ways of governance, new ways of doing policy. What they're looking for are new young graduates, much like yourselves, 
coming from law, um, economics, other traditional policymaking fields, but who have a different set of skills and a different way of working. They're looking, whether it's design thinking or other skills you're learning in the policy analysis or this series of classes, they're looking for people who come from these traditional backgrounds who can do rigorous critical thinking, but have ability to be creative, flexible, and tech literate. Where the focus is not just on analyzing the output and outcome of government policies, but that also focus on the human experience of what it's like to be a citizen or a resident in countries, how government feels, how policies feels, how they roll out on the ground. So they're looking, what I hear is a lot of searching for a new type of legal professional that can like be innovative. <laughs> so whether it's trying to come up with new business models, new po ambitious policy solutions, there's a real uh, backlash against lawyers for being just cold water or always explaining how things will fail. And there's a huge hunger for a new kind of lawyer who can figure out like how do we actually change legal and regulatory structures to allow for needed policy innovations? Or how do we work and harness with emerging tech or data gathering that's still ethical and responsible but that's not taken the given policy or legal landscape as a given. So there's just this need for these creative, entrepreneurial, policy-making lawyers. And this is kind of what I'm hearing from the field, from all of these government and intergovernmental actors who want this new kind of lawyer. They want lawyers who are creative, who are able to test and refine ideas, not just write long policy reports or normative recommendations, but can actually set up empirical tests and get more data about what works, who are really practical, so aren't just talking in abstract, big, um, uh, fancy words, but actually are engaging with people and the folks who are uh, affected by the policy, and who can facilitate, who can bring lots of different stakeholders together and make forward movement. These are the kind of skills I'm hearing, like why don't we have more lawyers who can do these kinds of things? So with that background, I'm really interested in how we train lawyers <laughs> to, or other non-lawyers who want to cross over into this world and can bring this new kind of transdisciplinary set of skills. I'm focused mainly on civil justice system. I care a lot about how we make eviction and debt collection better in this country. Um, this is the motivating question I have. Why does the legal system harm so many people, whether you're a judge, a lawyer, uh, mainly a legal aid lawyer, or a self-represented litigant? Why does the legal system make your life worse instead of better? So using the design methods and everything from this building, uh, we can look at that system, for example, the eviction system, and instead of writing a big report about all the problems with it or what could be better, we try to be really concrete about different interventions that we can come up with to improve that system. Everything from new visual designs, document designs, to new products, new technologies, to new services we can offer, to new ways we could be changing the organizations that operate, all the way to the guts of the system, the court rules, the regulatory regime, other dynamics of the system. So when we think like a designer going into a policy area, we're trying to think along this spectrum, these kind of orders of design, not to be too jargony, about where we can intervene and where we might have the most impact. So that's kind of one part of the design view, is thinking across a range of ambitions about where to intervene. I think a lot of times in law school, we're trained to focus on systems. We go straight for how do we change legislation? How do we have impactful um, advocacy movements or um, lawsuits or other types of lobbying efforts? As a designer, we're also thinking about a much broader set of interventions that could be really powerful and actually are a lot quicker to roll out if we're changing the documents, the websites, the apps that the court uses, for example. So in our lab, we use a design-driven process. Let me tell you what that exactly means before we try it ourselves. The main reason we use the process from this building and not the traditional one from the law school, well, we try to meld them together, but we really believe that in order to come up with ambitious new ideas to fix our systems, I like the process in this building better. You can choose for yourself. Um, so when I say the word design, it's about looking at problems through a new pair of glasses, a new view. Because are all of you law students? Are all of you, not everyone? Those of you who aren't law students, which domain are you coming from? Tell me your domains. Or policy. policy, great. Public policy. Uh-huh. Psychology. Psychology. Healthcare policy. Oh, terrific. Okay. You were in a session last year, right? Great. 
Um, because if you are a law student, you have probably been told that you're paying really high tuition to be able to think like a lawyer, right? That you're paying for like a very expensive point of view to think critically, to analyze risk, to see how things might go wrong. Design is a very good complementary way of seeing, which is much more about focusing on opportunities. Where could we be intervening? Where are promising opportunities? Not just thinking about risks, but thinking more about opportunities. To practice like a designer, we're looking for opportunities, and then this is how we actually work to come up with better ideas, new ideas. First of all, we talk to people. So instead of assuming that we can sit in a beautiful, air-conditioned, well-coffeed room to think about what the community needs or what we should be building, we should go talk to people, observe the ground truth, and use that information and, and um, community building to actually find where we should be investing resources or what interventions we should be trying. We should be building those solutions right alongside the people who are going to be affected by them. And we should be committed to basically being empirically honest, actually testing whether our great ideas work and what data we have to prove that we should invest more resources in our great ideas for policy change or tech change. What that looks like like a process and what we're going to follow today, which never works very cleanly in, pro in action, but it's a good heuristic to use uh, when you think about what is the design process. What we teach in most of our classes is to follow this basic um, recipe. One, when you're given a brief, like at the start of your policy lab class, you might be given a partner who has a challenge for you. The first step if we take a design approach to that challenge is to go out and talk to a lot of people, go observe in the field, where is this playing out, who are the stakeholders, what does it look, smell like, feel like. Also do a lot of secondary research as well. Then synthesize that into a framing of what is the core problems or where are there key opportunities here. So we spend a lot of time in the first half of classes trying to frame the right problem that we get from a partner reframing it based on what we see and hear in the field and from the data. Then we loop almost like a startup through building and testing cycles, coming up with ideas about what some interventions, policy changes, tech changes, organizational changes might be. But we hold ourselves to account. We can't just write those down in a giant list and call it done. We have to make first versions of those ideas, put them into the field, and see if they stick, see if they have value and then inevitably cycle through several of these building and testing loops until we test something that seems to have real value and impact, and then think about investing resources into a pilot or a scale out of that. That's not how typically government innovation or policy projects work. Typically, it's like at this stage of a project life, OK, we have a problem. Let's get a lot of people into a working group, write a memo, what can we make? invest lots of resources, get a giant budget, and just build that thing. With a design approach, we spend a lot more time up front in this messy, ambiguous space of saying, what actually is the problem? Who, are we, who is our audience? What are we actually trying to solve for? We explore a lot of different directions, and then we gradually narrow down to saying, there is value here. Here are the people we are trying to serve. Here is our perspective. Test that, and only if it tests well, invest a big budget into it. This is not how policy making typically is done. And this is what hopefully you'll feel in our mini workshop today, is getting comfortable being in this ambiguous space where you can't solve the problem right away. Because I think the lawyerly instinct and the engineering instinct, I don't know about policy and psychology instinct, is as soon as you get a problem from a partner, is to be like, OK, I know what to do here. I have a solution. I think a lot of us are solutions kind of people. A design approach tells you to stand back, go out into the field, defer to other people, and not jump to the first solution that you think about. Oof, the slide is busy. busy. Uh, there's a lot of different mindsets we teach our students. I can't talk about all of them. One of them I think it's really important for lawyers to focus on is about pausing feasibility. I facilitated a lot of workshops with you know, corporate lawyers, law professors, judges, other very senior lawyers. I think one of the pitfalls of lawyers doing creative or innovative work is how much they love to kill ideas. Where it's like a sport of like, you come up with an idea, 
I, in my lawyer brain, am so excited to tell you all the ways it's going to fail and like crush you and make you be quiet. So there'll be phases in the process where we want that critical point of view. We don't want to be living in a naive um, perspective. But what we want is that we can get the best out of each other and the best out of a group by having these moments where we say anything goes. We are definitely not going to undermine each other or we're going to pretend that legal, financial, regulatory constraints don't exist, laws of physics don't exist. What could be? Because I think a lot of lawyers talk themselves out <laughs> of good ideas before they even take a chance to um, think them through or experiment with them. OK, so before we get to a little story, before we do the workshop, let me just tell you the three main ways I see lawyers, both in corporate and in public interest, fail when they try to do work like we're going to do, trying to use new innovation methods or come up with breakthrough ideas. Because I've sat through a lot of meetings on this. <laughs> I'm on the ABA. Center for Innovation, where it's just a lot of very important judges and lawyers talking about how to be more innovative. So not holding them to account on these, but I'm speaking generally. How does legal innovation fail? First is lawyers get together, and I think law firms are notorious for this. They have innovation committees, and they say, what can we do to be more innovative, to make better legal services, to make our system work better? And they come up with ideas in their boardroom uh, and they think people will love them, and then no one uses them. No one shows up. Legal aid groups are also famous for this, where they build apps to help people do things, and then no one ever downloads those apps. I have been a part of many of those projects. So how do we stop ourselves from going down these roads, having great ideas, and then no actual interest or use of our great ideas? The main strategy from design is to get out of our own lawyer or other professional-centric brains and go out and talk to people. So for example, this was across the hall. This was back in 2017 when Kamala Harris was still attorney general. And she came to our lab with the problem of, we built a website. We, the attorney general's office of California, want more young people to clean their criminal record. We built a website with best intentions, and no one is using our website to actually apply for cleaning of records. What can we do to get more people onto our website? So that was the problem we got from the policymaker, and we took that into our lab on a Saturday for five hours. So my lab partnered with a community group from East Bay um, that is all about youth and justice in the East Bay. So their group recruited about 15 young people who have criminal records in their early 20s. So they came over here, and we mixed them up with folks from the AG's office, the Judicial Council, the California Statewide Agency for the Courts, and a bunch of engineers and designers from Code for America, a group of civic-interested techies. And we spent the first half of the day going through the current AG's website, saying, Dear young people, what do you like or not like about this website? Would you ever recommend it to your friends? What do you find confusing? And you can see that debrief going on on the whiteboards, where they get to tear apart this well-constructed, well-meaning AG's initiative. A laundry list of everything that's wrong. It's kind of the easy part. Then we spent the rest of the day putting the onus on them. What would you build? Let's talk about it. Let's think about it. If you had to get 10 of your friends to actually come to a service, a website or whatever, what would you build to actually get more young people to apply to clean their criminal records? And then they could work through their ideas with the engineers and designers and the policymakers to actually make something viable. Does anyone want to guess what the big idea that emerged from that day was. If you had to put yourself in the mind in 2017 of a young person from the East Bay, what do you think they proposed back to the AG's office? Any guesses? You're younger than me. Yes. Uh, put it somewhere where they're going to find it. Like, what did that be? Social media. Yes. Yes. It actually, yes. That was part of it. Yes. Social media. Any other thoughts? Yeah. They didn't want anything that would live on their phone. That was one of the, when government tries to think like young people, they always say like, let's build an app. But in fact, people do not want to download apps. And that's like a huge high burden, especially if it's from the AG's office. Do you want an AG's app on your phone? Probably not. 
but they did want a mobile-friendly website that would look great on their phone. So it was a mobile-friendly website they proposed. Any guesses about what should be on that website, or even what colors it should be? Golf? No? Colorful. Colorful. Yeah. Yes, they wanted, it was a nice, respectable Navy and maroon website, mm -hmm. government. They wanted kick, kick color, so like neon yellow, bright pink. They wanted like radically fluorescent colors. So definitely a different character and feel to it. Yep. Also probably explaining like why it's important. I don't know what that would mean in kids. Yeah. So the government also thought like, okay, we need to at least justify if you come to this website why you should stay and spend 20 minutes filling in your information. So the government strategy was bullet point list or maybe another government like innovation idea that always comes up, a board game. Let's make a board game <laughs> where they can go through. Young people don't want to spend 15 minutes playing a board game on some random website, uh, especially if it's a government website. What they wanted was chat. They wanted to chat with a fictional version of Rihanna or Chris Tucker about why this is important, what would happen. They could ask a question, get a response. So the same content the government would have written into a FAQ or a board game, but just delivered in a conversational and leveraging a celebrity. The end story of this is we presented it all back to the AG's office, and then she decided to run for Senate, and the project died. So that's like <laughs> a whole other thing about how to get actual innovation ideas to survive in the longer term, which we've been working on. This one, I won't tell as much of a story. This was in Pensacola, Florida, where a group of well-meaning foundations wanted to support people who were coming out of prison for opioids or other drug abuses, nonviolent drug offenders. There's a lot of drug rehab places around Pensacola. So the foundations all wanted to make sure that these guys didn't go back into prison. They wanted reentry services. How do we get people in that first week or two weeks to get back on track and not to reoffend? Um, so what we did is we spent one week in Pensacola with all the foundations, services, grandmas, and the prisoners and their guards in a room that had very bad coffee and like no circulation, but we were all in a room together and we spent a whole week coming up with ideas of what services the foundations or other well-meaning people could offer. And then the prisoners basically saying where they would put those services. So when they're free, they're about like two months away from release. Like in that week after they're released, where are they going to be? What are the physical locations? What are the messaging and branding things? Should they be going after their wives, spouses, girlfriends, um, or grandmas? Like basically how to get to them. So there was a whole big um, funding push and like three different locations. It all ended up in Pensacola being about churches. So locating all these legal aid and government services, DMV services, in these different evangelical services that happen at 7 p.m. on Thursday nights. So definitely not in a government building in downtown Pensacola. So second main fail is a lot of theater. <laughs> and you'll see today when we do our post-its and we do our um, mappings and all of this, it's kind of fun to do design work because it's active. It feels like you're being creative. Um, but does it actually get to impact? So this is the whole reason we use a process and why we're really conscious about what our process is. And it's something I think when you go back to your policy lab classes, try to think about what is the process we are using and following? Are we holding ourselves accountable to an intentional process about how we as a group are working to make something new? Because often what happens is well-meaning ideas and even funding and resources, the process is to sit around a big room and talk and maybe to make bullet point lists or to draft a memo, but so much energy and potential is lost by ending up just talking to each other and writing a few things down. I'm a big believer, this is why I work and teach over here, is that by using a very active and visual process, we can vote on things, make decisions, be really concrete about what we're talking about. That it's not just words and phrases and proposals flying around and people not really paying attention to each other, but that if we are more concrete and visual, we can actually make better decisions and move faster. The third big fail is, like I was saying before, the solutionism of jumping straight to the first great idea that you or your team have. And this is, I think, in a hierarchical field like law, especially if a judge has an idea or a managing partner, 
oftentimes all the resources go straight to whatever that person at the top of the hierarchy, whatever idea they propose. We have to be really aware, wary of that. This is why we prototype and test. Because oftentimes, and you can see with the rollout of healthcare.gov or many other large Stanford projects, um, Stanford and the government are different, but any large bureaucracy that's trying to build something innovative and new, oftentimes they only fail well, way too late. After the thing has launched, after there's been a lot of money and time spent into it. So the whole goal here with prototyping and quick building is that we can learn what ideas to bail from before we spend significant resources on them. This is why we prototype things. When we come up with new ideas, we put them on post-its. We make bad sketches of them. We draw about how they would actually play out in storyboards. We use improv to act them out. Any way that we can make these ideas tangible and start to really figure out, are we talking <laughs> about something that really does have value? We build stuff. This is Daniel. He just graduated. Um, we were building prototypes of new eviction help websites. So we build websites by first making them out of post-its or uh, bad sketches, or good sketches too. Um, yeah, so let me just take you through a little story so you can see the whole cycle in pictures, and then we will do it ourselves. So what does it look like? So like I said, this is the question I care about, making the legal system work better for people. So I have taught now probably six classes, all in partnership with our local California Santa Clara County Court all about how people without lawyers can get through the civil justice system in a better way. This is like my big project. San Mateo County Court in downtown Redwood City. Uh, how do we help people without lawyers to get through this process better? So that's my big policy brief that I have been working on in many different iterations. What we do with a design process is we go to where people without lawyers are trying to get through the court process where we go and we stand in line at eight in the morning with them, we talk to them, we interview them. Why are you here today? What have you brought with you? What do you know? What do you want? What are you expecting? We go in and we observe. So again, in Redwood City, um, sitting with people as they're trying to fill in their forms, as they're getting 30 minutes free with a Justice Corps volunteer, we can see where are their breakdowns, where are their opportunities, where can we either put new policy, new tech, or new services to make this better for a person and for the system. We go through it ourselves. This is Akiva, he was a law student here two years ago, I think he graduated, where he filed for divorce. I mean, not the actual filing, but he had to go through all of the steps of figuring out what forms to use, filling out giant packets of forms, waiting in line, all of the actual steps to really feel what the experience of the system is. We do a lot of exit interviews as people are coming out of their hearings with judges to ask them what they understood, what could be better. We talk with advocates who are obviously on the ground and know a lot about the trends and the um, experiences from their point of view. We do community feedback and design sessions where we get people, for example, people who are two years out of their divorce. We get them in a room on a Saturday with the judges, the court administrators, the legal aid lawyers, and the private bar to talk about why the heck is divorce so bad? Why does it take so long? Why does it cause so much harm and pain to families? And what can we do to make it better? So kind of like a focus group with all of these different stakeholders that are actually proposing new ideas. More of that. We, as our student lab team, tried to figure out where are the biggest opportunities we could be building new things for. We do maps of what it's like to go through court. We map out all the policies and rules that are part of this system. We start brainstorming what could be better, what could we put into the system to make the user experience and the system better. We come up with tons of ideas, <laughs> tons and tons of ideas. And then we invite people in to vote on them, to edit them, to tell us what's wrong or what's right. We have them kind of go through all of our best guesses about new things to build and tell us where we're getting it wrong or right. We have them rank and vote and spend fictional money on our new ideas. We have them rank them. And then as we start to get feedback about what actually has the most promise, then we build that new tech, that new service, or that new policy prototype, and we invite users and system owners back in to test it more. Lots of testing, lots of talking. So some of our ideas before we do our own workshop, we make lots of visuals. For example, a visual guide. If you ever get sued for credit card debt in California, 
here are the eight steps that you will go through trying to make it really visual. Or this is for traffic court in Alameda County. All the steps you need to do to get a fee waiver or a, a ability to pay waiver if you can't afford your traffic ticket. The court's using this right now in LA County too. We do a lot of app building um, to help people go step by step through the process, like of getting a domestic violence restraining order in Ohio. We do a lot of text messages. We have about 10 different pilots around the country where we're sending people text message reminders about an upcoming hearing or um, the next step in their long, long legal journeys. Um, we're doing a lot around eviction, things to fill in your answers, to make your claims, know your defenses. And we're also getting into more AI design where we're working um, with several different universities on Reddit. If anyone's ever been on Reddit's legal advice subreddit, yes, no? If you're a lawyer or a law student, you should definitely go check out the legal advice subreddit. It's just like hundreds of legal fact patterns every day of people's stories, whether it's apartments leaking or criminal enterprises or immigration crises. We've taken all of those stories that people post on Reddit in the public domain, and then we're building AI to learn from these stories to automatically issue spot what legal issues are present in a given two paragraph or five paragraph story with the idea that we can do better referrals to people who are showing up on Reddit or other social media to get them to the right legal aid group in their jurisdiction. And we do a lot of policy work as well. So at the same time as we're building all these tech things and changing documents and kind of lightweight, easy stuff, we are also talking to regulators of the legal profession. So for example, in the state of Utah, which is very innovation centric, we're working with the Supreme Court and the bar on setting up a regulatory sandbox, which I won't go into the details of now, but basically blowing apart the legal professional rules that you might have learned of in ethics about who can offer legal services and how lawyers are regulated with the idea that we might open up to a lot more robot lawyers or non JD kinds of uh, lawyers. We, I'll talk about this if you want to. I won't bore the rest of you. So let's try it ourselves. Enough of me talking. Any questions before I give you a design brief, put you in teams, and make you do design work? Questions? Now's the time, please. I guess this is about the sandbox, but how do you get around those? like the established rules, especially when they're like law. You get a regulator. So the Supreme <laughs> Court is the regulator. And the Supreme Court wanted to be innovative. We want innovative tech companies to come to our state. We want new business models that can serve the citizens of Utah better. What can we do? So there was, they basically invited three of us in, three academics or people working in this policy design innovation space in the justice system, and said, what are your big ideas about what we can do? <laughs> Yeah, so that's the basic policy process is you have a regulator who knows they want a big objective like innovation. I can geek out with you about regulatory sandbox things, but they can basically change how regulation exists. The Supreme Courts hold that power. So they can say, actually, all these professional rules, we don't want them anymore. Now we want to try something else. And is that the same thing for prototyping? Like, you just need a regulator buy-in to say, mm -hmm. like, we're going to try these things, and if they, you know, if they fail, then it's not going to be a big issue? My basic strategy is to incubate stuff so that at least it's clear what the thing is. Like, for a regulatory sandbox, we held a big workshop last November downstairs where we introduce this idea of like, hey, in financial services, they're trying regulatory sandboxes. Let's take two hours and figure out what that could look like in legal. So we had lots of bar leaders and judges there, and we made a diagram, a sketch. That was enough of a prototype that when we went to the Utah Supreme Court, they said, oh, you have a diagram. Like literally, I showed them this diagram we had made, and they're like, oh, that's a thing. We could think about how that's a thing. Whereas if you had like a spiel, I don't know, even the diagram as a prototype ended up being enough to justify to them, for better or worse. Um, but that was supplemented. We had a lot of other research-based calls. But like having something tangible or like diagram-like ends up having a lot of power. So yeah, now we're actually prototyping it in for real right now. Yes. OK, any other clarification questions before we get to designing? OK, let's do it. So we're going to go through these stages very quickly, at least to, I'll give you a challenge, and you're going to,
talk about it, think about it, start to synthesize, and maybe get to building and testing some new ideas. Make sure that you have about three to four people in your group. If you have more than three to four people, I would say join another group. So let's spend like one minute making sure that you are in a three to four person unit. If you are bigger than that, everyone good? Everyone has a group? So now the space is yours. So like I've shown you lots of pictures of how to use visuals or what it looks like. There's whiteboards, there's whiteboards, there's whiteboards. I would say each of your team, as a, after I give you the design brief, claim a whiteboard, wheel it over, lock it down. There's locks on the casters. Over in the back are post-its, sharpies, whiteboard markers, erasers. So, oh, I think the teams can go use them. Um, yeah, so everything is yours, everything is free. Please use generously. Okay, so the challenge I'm giving you is for each of your teams, to answer this question or to come up with ideas to answer it. How might we get more Stanford students, law school or beyond, to enter into public interest careers? So your teams have each been hired by a fictional foundation, the Public Interest Future Foundation. They want ideas about how to get more students to spend their future careers in public interest work. They want your team specifically to generate ambitious, and hopefully successful ideas that they could possibly fund. So they're looking at you particularly for something radical, something unexpected. It doesn't have to be fully fleshed out, but it could help them set their funding agenda. Any questions about this broad mandate before I give you some design instructions? There's a foundation. They want to incentivize more Stanford grads to enter into public interest careers. Okay. What we're gonna do first? Go, uh, uh, yes, please. General question, maybe it's useful to level up because uh, from Brazil and I guess we all we all know from from US, in Brazil everybody is into public, you know, because the the wages are really high comparing to okay. private sector. So uh, could you just tell me why this is so hard? That is what you will talk about in your groups. I can't, okay. So I, as the, I'm pretending to be the funder right now. All I know is that not enough students are going into public interest. I have an interest in more Stanford students, okay. law students or otherwise. So let's go to that. Let's figure out what are the dysfunctions, what's ha or the problems or not problems that is resulting in more students or not enough. Yes. Sorry. Uh, what do you mean by public? Yeah. That is, again, something that you can talk about in your group, <laughs> knowing that oftentimes you get a mandate that is broad. Like uh, on this weekend, I was tasked with thinking about how do we incentivize more faculty to work on public interest technology. The funder, the group who gave us that brief, did not define what public <laughs> interest technology is. So your job is to figure out what this big concept might mean. And if you don't, you can always ask and work around, but you have to deal with the ambiguities in the group. So what I want you to do is to, with your group, take a big board and talk and write and draw. So some of the things to talk about. What have you experienced being on Stanford campus, being in this milieu for however long you have been, about if students are going into public interest or not? Is this really a problem? Do we need to reframe this problem back to our partner, our foundation? What have you observed or heard from others about if this is a problem, how it is, how it plays out? What are the dynamics? What ideas do you have just from the top of your head about how you might incentivize more students to be in the public interest? As you talk about these things, the goal is to put them onto the board in a map. And one very useful map for this kind of conversation is to divide your board into four quadrants. On the left top, you can talk about what's going well right now, current positives. Are there actually a lot of students going into public interest? And here are some stories, here are some data, here are some examples or things that are incentivizing students that way. Then talk about current negatives, or maybe start here. It's always easy to start here. What's going wrong? Why are students not going into public interest? Where are their dysfunctions? Where are there things that should be working but aren't working? And then on the right side of the board, talk about the future, your ideas. What could be better? What ideas do you already have bubbling up about how to incentivize more public interest careers or kind of better outcomes that could result? And then finally, the lawyer quadrant, future negatives. What could go wrong? So let's say either you have a great new like uh, 
loan repayment plan. How could that actually go wrong? So you could think about kind of dysfunctions that might result from ideas you have up here, or you could talk about just the bad future that might be if we don't get this problem solved. So the point is to have a big, wide-ranging discussion and to understand what the heck is this design brief by talking it out with your teammates, mapping out what you talk, and your board should look something like this. So you have kind of post-its or ideas in each quadrant. The only way to do this part wrong is if you are not writing down while you're talking. So the point is just to start with a conversation about public interest tech or public interest careers at Stanford. How do we get more students to do it? Or is this even a problem? Get a board, get some post-its, get some Sharpies and whiteboard markers. Uh, I'm here to help and we'll do this for about 10 minutes before we go to the next step. Shoot and it's the first 10 years out of law school. They don't have pro bono. They don't have, uh, you know, wide array of pro bono. Just like, uh, like, uh, yeah. Think of moving on and stretching your design muscles. The next step we would do in the class is to put people back into this discussion. So probably you have general phases, phrases, abstract words. We want to put the human back into the conversation, which means figuring out who are the people that we should be focusing on. So in your teams, reflect on basically who you're talking about. And you have some latitude to move. You could focus on only law students or only law students from Brazil. Or you could focus on only students who are in Stanford in government, in SIG. You can decide what user group you say back to the foundation you want to focus on. So it's not like you have to serve everybody in this focus point. But basically, reflecting back on your conversation, who are the main people that you're focused on about changing their behavior, getting them new services, intervening with them? You can decide. Make a decision pretty quickly because we're going to ask you to do something right away, which is draw a picture of them. So typically, we have you do maybe three, like three different stakeholders, three different types of people in the system. We're going to start you, though, with our limited time on just one. So choose one person. So maybe it's a 2L who's about to make a decision about whether they sign on or whether they really are going to go down a corporate track or go work for a nonprofit. Maybe it's an engineering student who has a job offer from Amazon but is thinking maybe to go work in the mayor's office instead. You think about who, it, or it could be a law firm pro bono partner or a foundation person or someone else who you think is actually really central to focus on. Your group can decide. But what I want you to do is draw a picture of that person, even if it is literally a stick person. That's OK. Give them a name, a real name. Give them an age range, and a line or two about their background story. Think about being a filmmaker or a short story writer. Give this person some actual humanity. And then list out in bullet points, what, are this, what is this person's short-term needs, mainly around money or grades or other kind of short-term pressures? What is this person's longer term goals? Their aspirations for their career or the type of human they are? Kind of bigger questions. And then finally, think about if and how they like to use technology or not, consume information, what kind of messaging, all that kind of stuff we talked about with the young people and the criminal records. Like, um, what are some of their like tech and info profile? Who well, maybe it will take you a little bit long to get to all of this, but hopefully at least get one or two needs or goals, because we'll use that in our next round of work. Is this okay? So choose at least one person who seems to be central and put some story around them and their needs and goals. Okay? Make sure someone draws a real person. <laughs> Okay, hold on. Uh, okay,
Let's just take a breather. So let's say if we were not in a very abbreviated time crunch of trying to do this in an hour, what would you do right now before we make the leap down that design thinking recipe to start coming up with ideas and brainstorming? If you were doing this as part of a class or a real project with a real foundation, what would you do at this point in your process? Yes. I think it would be really good to talk to people. Yes. <laughs> who they are, what they want to do. Yes. Just talk to a bunch of people. So even if we had like 20 minutes or half hour, what could you do to talk to people? What would you do if I told you go talk to people, Shalini? I have a sort of person in mind, so I would go to where they might they might cluster. <laughs> <laughs> Where are these people clustering? So Let's go there. Proper garden, or yes. or you know any cafe, and go like, hey, you look like you could be a target subject. Yes. <laughs> so oftentimes that's what we do in our first week of classes: is we go up to people awkwardly around campus and we ask them questions for five to twenty minutes, and people talk to you even if you don't have compensation or anything. I mean, at the courts, we do have compensation and consent forms. So we go up to people awkwardly and say, would you talk to us for five minutes? And we try to check our own assumptions, because everything we have on our board is from our own personal, anecdotal, or maybe hard data sets. But it's through a very biased lens. So how do we try to check whether we are even putting the foundations for our project along the right track. And maybe some of you are this person and you have a lot of real lived experience, um, but especially if you're making assumptions about other people, how can you as soon as possible get out of this context where it's really easy to start coming up with ideas right away and get out to check them. So going up, that's what we call kind of man or woman on the street kind of testing. Or you can go on Craigslist and say, hey, I'm gonna pay $75 to you Craigslist, and then I'll pay like $5, $10, $30. Who wants to come talk to me about their experiences about choosing a public interest career or not? So we did that a lot with traffic tickets or evictions where you can get 40 people to come talk to you if you offer proper compensation. I guess my question is, is there ever a worry about like who's a self-selecting group? Yes, answering? definitely. How do we like build things and design to like mitigate that? This is a huge question. So for eviction, for example, we got lots of people who came to our from our Craigslist recruit who had all been the ones to have proactively gotten a legal aid lawyer or filled in paperwork. We weren't getting the people who never even opened their eviction notice. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole other scouting thing of partnering with local community orgs, not going through like recruitment channels or official things. In the past, like with divorce, we had really good luck. We just wrote letters to everyone who had been divorced in a certain region and we just sent letters to everybody, paid them several hundred dollars and got a much wider group of types of litigants there. So each project is different and different context. Um, but yeah, it's really good to be intentional. That's why almost like going somewhere and just showing up and not going through a long, complicated recruitment process, you can usually get a bigger diversity of people. But each project, we try to be intentional about that. What else could we be looking at besides talking to people? Yeah. I think I would look to the trends in what's emerging. Yeah. Um, How would you get trends in what's emerging? Well, we kind of like bucketed our ideas around like what are they really about? What are they getting at? Because I think that's a better way to think about what solutions could be like more, um, have more weight. Yeah. Let me open to the group. If, you ha if I tasked you, I was your teacher, and said, go find me over the course of the next week. What are the big trends in public interest career choice? Where would you go to to find information on trends? What could you do? Who could you bother for that? Where do we get that kind of information? Yeah. Google. What would you Google? <laughs> but Google, like public interest and like uh, recent news, was the big issues happening recently. So some kind of secondary research and see what journalism is out there. So maybe there's something substantial, or maybe there's editorials, points of view. So you can go the news route. Where else could you go to? Think about around campus. Yeah. Yeah, I can go like to the office of career and ask for information about yeah. you know, the past ten years. Yeah. Where like the alumni is working now. Who's doing recruiting? Where is there conversion events where people are changing pathways? You could see where in people's one to two L to three L or LLM careers 
Are they actually making the choice? And do people who commit here then go end up there? Who holds data? Who holds the quantitative data? So OCS, Office of Career Services, Haas Center, Office of Admissions even. Like where do we find the actual data? That's the other thing we need to be balancing our deep qualitative work with strong quantitative work as well. Okay, people are leaving, goodbye. So let's generate some ideas. Let's, um, we can talk more about design process if you want to afterwards, but for the sake of our sacrificial project, let's start brainstorming. So I'm gonna set some ground rules about how we'll do our brainstorm. These are some of the rules that we use in design to make sure that we are thinking as creatively and ambitiously as possible. These ground rules are, First, if you already have a great idea, like maybe you, as soon as you heard me say the challenge, you said, I know what we need to do. We need tax incentives, we need tax breaks. Maybe you're all about tax breaks or any other idea. Try to put that to the side and force yourself to think about other ideas right now. Second, this is the part where we are pausing feasibility and not killing ideas. So the whole goal is as other people talk or as bub ideas bubble up in your head, you are putting them on the board regardless of how stupid or uh, if you think about it for five seconds, you realize how the idea would fall apart. That doesn't matter. We are trying to live in a world without legal, regulatory, financial constraints. There's infinite budget, no laws on the books. We are not gonna shoot any ideas down now. And that means this kind of improv spirit of saying yes and to any idea that comes out from your group. And this is really important for group dynamics just to be aware of in future project work. As soon as you start to break other people's ideas down in these kinds of sessions by saying no, or the classic lawyer, yes, but, <laughs> you are effectively shutting down their openness in that kind of group setting. So how do you really listen to other people's ideas and build off of them instead of just listening and then saying the own idea that you were thinking about in your head? So it's really about bringing out the best in others. We want you to come up with wild and ambitious ideas. After this, we'll pull them back down to earth. And we want you to draw and write concisely on Post-its. So if you have drawing or sketching abilities, if you draw an idea, it's much more likely to survive the culling that's about to come. So draw and your idea will probably survive. The whole goal of this brainstorm is to get a ton of things on the board. Quality is not important, quantity is. It's the act of just coming up with ideas that will hopefully lead to at least one promising idea. That's all we need is one promising one. So the whole goal is to just fill up the board like a maniac team. To think about that wide pyramid of different ideas that I had shown you during the presentation, I want you to make a grid and think about products, new products you could make to solve this person's problem, services you could be offering, policies, regulations, rules you could be changing, policies read very broadly, or wild cards, things that you don't necessarily know how it fits in these categories. These are all kind of sacrificial. The whole goal is to just stretch your thinking from small things to giant things, okay? So what I want you to do is to make a little bit of a grid, a product section, a services section, policy section, and wild card section of your board, and then think back to your user and the foundation's challenge to you and say, what could we build, what could we do specifically for this person's situation? And your board should end up looking like this, crazy. So don't worry about the columns, just worry about the rows. What are new products for this person, services, policies, wild cards that get more public interest career commitment, okay? And we'll go for about seven to eight minutes, pretty quick, so try to come up with lots of ideas, write them down quickly, and fill up the board. But the last round of brainstorming is like a call and response. So I'm going to put up a prompt, for example, this prompt. You now, for the next uh, minute, have five billion dollars. I want you to think about more ideas. Just put them up with the rest of your ideas so they could be five billion dollar products or policies or wild cards. If you had to spend five billion dollars on this person's problem in three months, what could you do? for $5 billion. So put up some ideas, just put them in the rest of your things. 
and then I'll give you another prompt. So try to come up with ideas quickly for $5 billion. What can you do really, really cheaply? $5 or less. Come up with a new idea that's $5 or less. Maybe as a product, so in general, that just the public service more attractive with regard to it. It's high emotions. How do you make your target user cry with happiness or fear or shame or name your emotion? How do you get them really, really emotional? What could you do? Budget regardless. Who cares about budget? Think about emotional impact. Make them cry, scream, yell. OK, next one. How do you get to the opposite effect? How do you drive people away from public interest careers? So come up with some opposite ideas to stretch your brain. What's the worst idea you can come up with to solve this challenge? Opposite effect. Okay, I saved the hardest one for the last. This is the last thing we do before we come back together. So now I want you to think analogously. So pretend that it's not about Stanford students and public interest careers, but that it's some other type of situation that we're familiar with, where we're trying to convince people to do something, incentivize them, coach their behavior. What can we borrow from other worlds, other industries, to put into here. So what could we borrow from ride sharing about how they incentivize or reward people or get them to behave in a certain way? What could we learn from YouTube or buying a plane ticket or car mechanics? These are just random things, but try to pick one of these things. It should hurt your brain, but say, what if a dentist, <laughs> how would a dentist solve this problem of getting people to choose one path over another, a public interest career path or another? Would they give them laughing gas? Would they strap them down and sedate them? Like, what are ways, things we can learn? And use those little weird nuggets to come up with an idea that might be practical. But the goal is to be ambiguous, uncomfortable, unclear, but have good discussions as you're talking about that. So choose one and try to say, how could we learn from how hospitals control people's behavior or reward career progression, whatever it is. Try to borrow from this and come up with a few last ideas, and then we'll come back together. OK, I'm going to call the brainstorm to the end. Hopefully, you had a productive, like how many groups if you want to raise your hand, thinks you have at least one idea that might be ambitious and feasible, like you'd actually be proud to share it with other people, and you think maybe this could actually be funded or supported. Oh, okay. We have. Let's hear just like two idea, two or three ideas. Um, this was a little strange, but from frozen yogurt shops, like the benefit is getting to sample when you go. So the idea of like people are really fearful of like government or public service being like stagnant. So having some kind of program that allows them to sample different work. Yeah. 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 Um From the frozen yogurt, adding toppings to it. So and like colors and flavors. <laughs> so <laughs> like making it more attractive, like uh, benefits, like more vacations, uh, oh, yeah. more. Uh, uh, hired. That's how they hire us at Stanford. They call them sweeteners, where we like sweeten. Yeah, yeah that's good. All these little benefits and HR things. Perks. Yeah. YouTube sort of real person testimonials from the PI world about how amazing it is to work in public interest. Storytelling and faces, so you're not so scared about some yeah. bureaucracy. Yeah, you see other people who have died as a role model. Um, we have a few ideas, and we plan to be really helpful to kind of give people an idea of what long term careers would fellowship model is like a year when you afterwards. How do you build that sustainability into just thinking about this? It's cool even just to see like canvases or maps of like people's careers like Brian Stevenson, how did you get like show me your career map or uh, or even like yeah, just, how you got to Oh that's very interesting to think about. I like that idea. Okay. And some of those are cheap. Like that doesn't necessarily cost 
millions of dollars and huge amounts of tech. What the next stage would look like. First, we would vote. So we might get all of the ideas together or in the groups, like walk around, look at each other's teams so you're not always with the same group of people. And then we would use kind of democracy in action to vote which ideas to move forward, which ideas to abandon. Then we would do some prototyping. So we, I would challenge you to take one of those post-its and make a first version of it using foil, pipe cleaners, post-its, improv. So prototyping would be about taking this abstract of idea of like career path maps or a YouTube channel of PI things or a long-term frequent flyer uh, public interest relationship. How do we make that testable? How do we test if people would actually want or use that? So the way we prototype is we draw things. We make, like this is an online court where the student Melissa made a court where you can go up to people outside of Tresseter and say, hey, I just gave you a traffic ticket. Guess what? You owe me and the government $150. Do you want to Skype a judge or do you want to fill out a form? And if people press the post-it, Skype a judge, then Melissa holds up the next piece of paper which has a big hole cut out of it. She puts her head through it and says, what is your plea? And forces people to actually talk to a judge online. So how do you like hack the idea that you have to make it really quick and testable with the cheapest materials possible? Or this is McDonald's prototyping their new bakery. Everything is sketched. There's a little bit of fidelity to it, but generally it's quick and dirty. They can change it really easily if it doesn't test well. Or this is us hacking court, where we were putting new signage up in San Mateo County Court. No one stopped us. Just like new lines on the floor, new signs in the elevator. See if it gets people to actually change their walking behavior in court. Or this is a robot. This is a court robot of a student with a box over his head pretending to be a robot. Sure, why not? Um, so that's the kind of mentality, is taking this first idea, making the cheapest one hour test session so you're not waiting on this idea forever because the longer you sit on the idea the more boring it becomes and the more you get stuck with it because maybe these ideas are bad so how do you test them as soon as possible so you're not sitting on that bad idea and then we would go out and test that idea we would not pitch it we would go out humbly and welcome criticism. Like Melissa is getting reamed out by a German couple saying, why would I ever talk to a judge? I'm giving up all my rights. This is really a bad product. This is a policy failure. So we want to hear that now. Um, so this welcoming of criticism and not holding our ideas preciously tightly until the very end, and we hope that no one criticizes us. If we get criticism early as a type A personality, it's actually better for us because then we can anticipate where our major failures are. So we would go out and we would ask people or even like take your post-its after class and say, tell me one thing that's good about this idea, but please, please tell me how this idea could be better or how could this have harms or how could this fail? How could this make horrible New York Times headlines in five years. We want to anticipate failure, so not being in our bubble too long. So I'll end here. I'll just say, like, I'd love if you want to geek out about process, I love process. Or if you want to work on eviction system stuff or other civil justice stuff, I'm always looking for RAs and students. Thank you so much for your time. Um, yes, and it was great to see your ideas come out. So thank you so much. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Okay.